All right, thanks again uh, to Dr. Farrell and to Lindsay for what's been an outstanding day. And uh, I always hate to be the last person standing between cocktail hour and you, so I'll try to make this really brief <laughs> and uh, hit the high points. And uh, Craig asked me to talk a little bit about prevention, but not just about helmets, because I think by now, if you don't have the message that helmets are a good thing and that we should be using them, you've either been asleep all day or you may have adult attention deficit disorder. So I'm, not, I'm just going to take it as faith that you understand helmets are a good thing. But I want to talk a little bit beyond that about some other aspects of prevention that I think may be germane to those of you, particularly with regulatory bodies or overseeing athletes, and, and about um, what uh, other factors should we should be thinking about, and also about a little bit about leadership in that. So we're going to talk about recovery, equipment consideration, rule changes, some medical oversight, and legal issues with that, and then public education and awareness. Everything I've told you today, this is the most important slide, okay? So bells and whistles for this. Uh, by far, the most effective strategy for preventing a severe brain injury is avoiding a return to exposure before a previous injury has fully healed. <coughs> by far. It's not to say that you can't have a de novo severe brain injury. Sure you can. But by far, a lot of the ones we see from collision and contact occur in individuals who've had a previous brain injury that has not fully healed. And this is a major preventive strategy in keeping these athletes from going back out. In fact, in the sports world, we talk a lot about sudden impact syndrome. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, this is when an athlete has sustained an initial head injury, most often a concussion, and they get a second head injury before the symptoms have cleared from the first injury. And someone spoke about this earlier, that it's a real challenge. If somebody's got a femur fracture, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, Craig, but even I can diagnose there's a bone sticking out, something's wrong. When you look at someone with a brain injury, they often look normal on the outside. They often may tell you that they're normal. So they can be very injured and look and appear normal and report themselves as normal and go back out and compete again and suffer another injury. So we have a major push to keep these individuals from going back too early. The way this happens, we think, is in the brain. What happens, you lose auto-regulation of blood supply, you get a lot of swelling. They get increasing intracranial pressure. And here's the, the sobering statistics, at least a 50% mortality and 100% morbidity once they get into this. So this is a terrible situation, something that we're actively trying to avoid in our athletes. And we know it does happen, as I mentioned earlier, uh, symptoms do show up on a delayed basis. This is some data out of a couple of studies looking at college level football players versus NFL. And we see that uh, out of a large cohort of NFL players who had an event and were returned to the same game, some of them still then had persistent symptoms that lasted more than a week, probably because they went back out and had an exposure before they were fully healed. And these symptoms can take on a lot of different uh, manifestations. And we think it's not just as simple as you had a bad impact, boom, you have a brain injury. There are clearly some pre-injury factors that go into this. Uh, and then you've got post-injury factors. So pre-injury, things like previous concussion history, previous neurologic history, exposure to alcohol, drugs, other substances like this. Uh, then once you have the injury, there are four different domains that can be affected cognitively, emotionally, behavioral, and physical disturbances that can lead to a whole host of these symptoms that you see here. So it's a very complex cascade, and again, it's not just a normal person gets a blow, has some symptoms after that, and recovers. There are a lot of different factors that, that play into this. Uh, we do know that there are certain risk factors we can identify, and there's some evidence I've shown you here. If you do have damage to your white matter on your scans, if you have certain genotypes, or if you have a pre-injury psychiatric history, you're more of a risk for a severe neurologic outcome after a concussive injury. So these are baseline factors we need to, uh, to hear about and to study in our athletes. A lot of ink has been spilled over the last few years about the cumulative lifetime risks and how, how, how many is too many and when do athletes have permanent damage. And so this has been particularly in NFL players. You've seen some studies that have come out suggesting that players have uh, long-term memory impairments after repeated milder injuries, not necessarily the severe injuries. And here's at least one study looking at the number of previous concussions and how many of these athletes later in their retirement reported memory problems I love the spouse uh, relative reporting column to see if there's a correlation there. But, but the point is that these are pretty striking incidence numbers, you know, if, if they've had three plus concussions, which many of our pro football players have, for example. So um, that brings to mind this whole uh, notion that's come up about that I mentioned earlier, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that there's progressive dementia, a deterioration of neurologic function in these individuals. Uh, that uh, may uh, be the result of this previous concussion history. I think the bullet point down here is, is very important though. This is really a low incidence, but a high potential chronic impact. 
So it's not happening with um, the epidemic levels that some have forecast, but it's a major problem. And it, and it brings to mind asking us what is the maximum number of safe concussions? How many can somebody have before they ought to be put out of their sport? Who thinks they know the answer to that? Anybody? I'll give you a bottle of wine from back here if you want. Anybody know the answer? Well, the answer is we probably don't know, but it probably is zero. I mean, a brain injury is a brain injury. There is a footprint from that. And so um, uh, that's not to say that anyone in the room who's had a concussion is going to be dysfunctional. I would be in that category as well. Uh, but, but the point is there's probably no such thing as a minor concussion. And certainly we have to be mindful of that individual's lifetime history, including, for example, non-sports activities. So, yeah, I was fighting on the playground and I fell off the monkey bars and got knocked out when I was age seven. Or I was riding my motorcycle and I crashed it in college. So these are factors that have to be considered. And since we don't know the evidence to support a cutoff for too many concussions, you really have to make this on an individual case-by-case -case basis. Now, this drives some of my medical doctor colleagues crazy. I'll pick on the internists. You know, they like guidelines that sort of say numbers. And they say, well, it's not fair. You can't treat two different people the same. I can't treat you one way and I can't treat you the other way. So, well, that's not really reality for us in athletic sports medicine. If I have a patient like I had this year who's five foot eight, 140 pounds, and he plays linebacker at a high school, and he's had his fourth concussion in the last two years, he's not going to make his living playing football, okay? No question. He's not even going to go to college on a scholarship to play football. So it's really not a hard decision to me to recommend to that individual and his parents that it's not a good idea for him to continue to be exposed to a, con a collision sport. You play basketball, play golf, but football is not a good idea. On the other hand, a kid from a disadvantaged background who's in college is going to be an NFL first round draft pick and make millions of dollars a very different decision. So I don't think that's too out of line with what we do in other aspects of medicine. But the point I'm trying to make is you have to individualize these decisions somewhat based on uh, the circumstances, the level of play, the ramifications, and the previous history. Um, I do think you've heard a lot today about equipment, and, and we know that uh, helmets, as I said, are, are clearly studied and have been shown to be a benefit. We're not even going to go through that. I found this uh, when I was looking around on uh, it came from the University of Vermont, a poster that was talking about, particularly about fit and how important fit is. And I'm glad you made that point, Craig, that an ill-fitting helmet may not be that protective. It's really key that you get the helmet fitted. And we see that all the time in football players, for example. So there's been a new generation of helmets that have come to market. For example, in football, this Rydell helmet, the, the revolution, the so-called concussion helmet. And this has been developed with some additional padding and some additional uh, ways that it fits and inflation options on the hopes that it would reduce concussions. I think you've also heard today that this is, this is not going to be the answer because it's not simply that direct force, the rotational forces that go into that. But um, one of the other problems with this is it's just very hard to study. And so they studied, for example, this football helmet in 2,000 high school football players and found that there was a little bit less incidence of concussion. So, of course, the company that manufactures this I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. They, they rushed out to say our helmet is better and prevents concussion. Well, like many things, the devil's in the details. A lot of these controlled helmets were uh, helmets that had been in use for more than 10 years. They were uh, not nearly the same quality of helmet that were being compared. And so we were really comparing apples and oranges here when we tried to, to take a look at this question in a scientific way. Um, and I think this is part of the trouble.